Um, welcome to everyone joining us today for this roundtable on a review of transitional agreements in the UK and considerations for the library and institutional strategies. Um, before we get to your questions, I'll do a brief presentation and then we'll hear from our panelists before we open it up to the floor. Uh, maybe should have started with um, introducing myself. So my name is Kira Brayman and I'm a data analyst at JISC and one of the co-authors of the recent report entitled A Review of Transitional Agreements in the UK. I'll be highlighting some of the key findings. Um, the report is incredibly rich, so I'll do my best to give you the highlights, but I do encourage you to read the full report if you've not already done so. Um, the size and scope of the review is large. I do encourage you to bring a, a pot of tea, you might need more than just one cup, um, but we have deliberately structured the review, the methodology and the data so that others, including other consortia and institutions can build on our findings. It's also JISC's ambition that the review act as an evidence base and catalyst for institutions, as well as funders, consortium publishers, to establish a roadmap to transition to open research and inform collective decision-making and planning, which is part of why we're here today. Uh, to this end, after my review of the key findings, we'll have several panel members who've been involved in the Transitional Agreements Oversight Group, or TAUG, um, which commissioned and reviewed the report. Uh, and they'll afterwards be speaking to how they and their institutions are responding to the findings. So you'll see we have Jeremy Upton, Director of Library and University Collections at the University of Edinburgh. Sarah Thompson, Head of Content and Open Research at University of York. And Stephen Vidovich, Head of Open Research and Publication Practice at the University of Southampton. I'll be asking our panelists some questions and then we'll be leaving lots of time for you to pose your own questions as well. I also want to extend my thanks to the team and other contributors that have worked so hard to input to the report and put it together. Before we get into the findings, I wanna take a brief step back and reflect on the context of transitional agreements when they started. As is outlined in section one of the report, uh, the context for the review is set out both from a UK and international perspective. It covers everything from the Finch report and the subsequent RCUK policy, which set a strong preference for the paid APC route in the UK, as well as discussion of lengthening embargo periods and the offsetting agreements that followed, which sought to constrain costs that would ultimately evolve into transitional agreements. TAs were adopted internationally by consor consortia and institutions to transition research outputs to open access while combating escalating subscription costs, OA costs, and administrative overheads. To serve this purpose, JISC has negotiated and renewed 75 TAs with 47 publishers since 2016. So it's been a large movement in its own right. Our review highlights the benefits of TAs, including efficiencies, significant cost savings, and high level of funder compliance during a period when realistically there were few alternatives for immediate routes to open access. For example, um, during the course of this study, only 32% of TA publishers offered a compliant green OA route. Although transitional agreements are not necessarily where we want them to be, the negotiation of these TAs exemplify what can be achieved by the sector by working together in concert. So in terms of our kind of first key finding, overall the UK's transition to OA has been greater and faster than the global average. In 2022, the proportion of open, by which we mean hybrid and gold articles in the UK was 4% higher than globally, after growing 4% faster since 2014. The transition to OA was also noted across all disciplines, including those with historically lower levels of research funding, such as the arts, humanities, or social sciences. TAs have also facilitated the publication of articles as open access from institutions that historically publish fewer articles. There are, however, some un unintended consequences. The UK's faster transition to open is predominantly due to the greater share of hybrid articles. We have more than double the proportion of hybrid articles than the rest of the world. So in the UK, there was 21% compared to 10% globally. If green articles are included, the UK's proportion of articles OA is even greater than the global proportion by 15%. 
While the UK appears to have trend be transitioning to OA more effectively than the global average, there has been a steady decline in the number of UK green only articles, around 4% over each of the last four years, which is a more exaggerated version of the global trend. While there is some indication of a shift to OA of TA publishers, these are relatively modest. The rapid increase in global TAs up to 2022 does not appear to have made a material impact on levels of open access, with the average proportion of closed content globally in TA titles for the 38 publishers investigated being 61%. Moreover, a transition to open is slow or headed in the wrong direction. 20 out of the 38 publishers maintained or increased the proportion of their closed content in their TA titles globally, from the year prior to the JISC agreement becoming active up till 2022. At the more specific levels of articles with a UK corresponding author, even still around 40% of research has remained behind a paywall for the last five years. Part of the answer to the more limited transition to open can be explained by the reach of TAs. While the TAs that we've negotiated were focused on transitioning the output of our UK members to open access, TAs are yet to make an impact beyond UK higher education and those institutions able to subscribe. So from the outer end of this circle, the dark pink ring shows any UK author. Then if you go in a level, we have any UK corresponding author. And then the third middle ring, which are those articles from corresponding authors affiliated to JISC institutions. That gap alone is quite significant, representing groups generally excluded from participating in TAs, such as researchers in health and social care settings, corporate research, etc. To me, this indicates that more options are needed for these institutions in order to publish open access. The fourth ring shows UK corresponding authors affiliated with JISC member institutions that are subscribing with the gap sorry, with the gap representing where institutions did not subscribe to a relevant TA. So in some ways, these could be considered missed eligible articles. Finally, in the innermost ring, there were nearly 40,000 articles published under TAs. All being well, our member institutions should be using the TA to publish their research open, but that is not always the case. There is a significant gap between the numbers of articles with the corresponding author at a JISC member institution and those published under T a TA of approximately 22,000 articles. For a full transition to open to be achieved in a reasonable time scale, there is a need for TAs or alternatives to be scaled up, both in terms of coverage, what is published under them, and in quantity, the number of agreements or routes. We also estimated at a journal level that titles aren't being flipped to open access at a rate that we would expect. Only three publishers flipped more than 10% of the journals included in JISC TA title lists. Of the big five publishers, Wiley flipped the greatest proportion of their JISC TA titles in the five years, which was 7%. However, even at that rate, it would take at least 70 years, 70 for TA titles to flip to OA. We have also examined costs and modeled costs under different scenarios to estimate cost savings and cost avoidance associated with TAs. We found that TAs constrained actual costs at a sector level. The 38 TAs examined delivered cost savings of £16.7 million in the first year compared to expenditure in the year preceding the TA for institutions that subscribed to both. Modeling costs of TAs against modeled costs of read-only subscriptions plus the cost of APCs, we estimate that subscribing institutions avoided costs of £6 million in 2020, increasing to £42 million in 2022, and a further £49 million when modeled into 2024. We've been careful to highlight that institutions may not have incurred these costs in reality, they're just modeled estimates. The longer term sustainability of an article APC based open access system is a key theme addressed within the report. Furthermore, the report also investigate that 
and shows that costs of TAs are still substantial and institutions stand to become increasingly reliant on open access block grants. The financial evaluation of cost effectiveness discussed does not account for the indirect cost of TAs, such as administration. While the scale of OA achieved via TAs would not be possible without the dashboards and reporting developed to manage and monitor TAs, overall efficiencies are still variable. Due to variations in offers, processes, and systems between TAs, the evaluation and management of TAs continues to be resource intensive for institutions requiring specialized staff and financial management. Transparency on how open access publishing charges are costed and transition roadmaps remain elusive for many publishers. Most TA publishers do not provide UK institutions or JISC with detailed expenses or revenue breakdown. For example, only nine of the 38 TA publishers submitted data to the Journal Comparison Service. Most publishers did not have or did not disclose an open access roadmap or definitive targets or timescales to flip journals or portfolios to open access. We have, not, we have deliberately not advised on whether TA should continue, either here or in the report itself, but it is clear that TAs, at least in their current form, are approaching their limits. I'll hand over to Sarah now, who will talk about the implications for the sector from the perspectives of the University of York. That's great. Thank you very much, Kira. Um, so as Kira mentioned at the start, I, I work at the University of York, where I'm responsible for content and open research. Um, and I'm also, along with Jeremy and Stephen, some of the members of the GIST Transitional Agreements Oversights Group. So we've been involved in discussions around TAs and trying to analyse how they're progressing, trying to assess how publishers are moving for a few years now. Um, and for me, the report's really helpful in crystallising um, some of the things we've been talking about over that period. So I think as I've been thinking about this more, it's what the report conveys is, for me, is a very clear sense that um, TAs are entrenching hybrid open access with the biggest publishers. And they're not, as we might have expected, um, moving us on to new open access models, and nor are they encouraging diversity and variety in publication venues, in fact, quite the opposite. So we're just seeing more consolidation. Um, at the same time, um, in UKHE, we're facing um, budget challenges. So at my institution, among many others, we have a pressing need to reduce our spend. And I do think this is a moment when we can be bolder we've got no option but to make some hard choices. And put bluntly, budget reductions are probably going to mean that we at York are going to begin to withdraw some, withdraw from some TAs from next year. Um, and I really do feel that we simply can't afford to wait for the biggest publishers to flip to open access um, entirely. You know, we just don't have the resources to put in and wait for all that length of time. So we're therefore likely to be divesting from underperforming TAs. Um, and I think that means that the, if you like, the all you can eat buffet will be scaled back considerably at York. Um, we know it can be done, but we acknowledge it won't be easy. Um, and I realise that for some of my colleagues in the library, it will be difficult because we take great pride in delivering excellent and streamlined services for our user communities. And this divestment is going to mean introducing more friction for our readers and authors. But we do need to be bold and take a different approach if we're going to achieve um, change. So alongside this uh, divestment, we are intending to protect our spend with smaller publishers um, and diamond models in the short term and increase it in the longer term. Alongside building capacity in our own university press and doing other things um, to encourage open, such as incentivizing the creation of OERs, and really, um, I guess, bringing open to the fore across both research and teaching in the institution. The GIST report also highlights that TAs entrench author behavior when it comes to choosing where to publish. I think it's so easy to publish open access um, when a TA is in place. So it's interesting, I think, to just pause and reflect if we're going to see authors making different choices if we take the habitual options away from them. Um, so particularly if we seize this as an opportunity to talk more about affordability and equity 
in our dialogue with academics about publishers, we might begin, hopefully, begin to see them making some different choices. So, yeah. I'll pass it on to Stephen now. Thank you, Sarah, and, and thank you, Kira, as well, for the introduction. Um, so at the University of Southampton, um, we can very much see the national picture that was just illustrated to us and, and through the report in our own, uh, reflected in our own institutional findings. So this is especially with respect to uh, hybrid open access uh, increasing and at commensurate rate, there being a decline in green open access uh, being the optimal way that the content's made available. And then within that, a, a steady decline of, of content that's actually being archived and could achieve open access uh, by the green route. Uh, whilst at the same time, the closed content remains steady. So that's a concern for me. And when we were asked to uh, review the, the, the report a while back, uh, colleagues had just asked us, um, you know, what are our what are our findings from this? What do we what do we take home from it? Um, and I basically said, well, it shows that these uh, transitional agreements aren't transformative because if we, that they're changing behaviour uh, and that they're detracting slightly from the green open access option, which is a credible route to transition itself. And so if I, I sort of did a thought experiment and thought, well, if we stopped these TAs tomorrow, where would we be? And apart from the odd agreement with a publisher that we can use rights retention um, and maybe some other small minor changes here and there, ultimately we'd be back to a position that we were in in 2018. So from my point of view, these haven't been transformative and we need to be uh, considering what we, what we can do going forward um, there are additional problems that have been faced at the University of Southampton, um, mainly around the sustainability of maintaining these TAs. So what we've noticed, and I'm sure many of you in this call uh, have noticed as well, is that there's been increasing costs to the university. And this is because of greater proportion of the agreements as they're being renegotiated, being uh, allocated to the publishing component which is ultimately what we wanted, but then that also means that we're incurring more VAT. And up until uh, Wednesday, uh, you might have thought me quite prescient um, if, if we had had this uh, round table at the start of the conference. Um, up until Wednesday, we weren't able to allocate uh, some of that expenditure back to UKRI uh, or other funders uh, because uh, they asked us to distribute the costs according to the way the publisher had uh, calculated it. Um, so this is creating an increased burden on institutional budgets, although those might now be relieved somewhat, thankfully, uh, because UKRI have taken the action that they announced on Wednesday. Um, but the issue also is that the, the reason for this is that a large proportion of the authors who are benefiting from these uh, agreements are un otherwise unfunded or funded by other uh, non-block grant providing funders. So in response to that, at the University of Southampton, we've been doing some work um, and we've been taking the notional cost of the APCs that have been avoided in very much the same way as JISC have. Um, and we've gone and done currency conversions on those according to the day that they were approved on the system. And we, we've then used that data to create regression analysis uh, and to calculate the fixed and the variable costs on a monthly basis so that we could project forward based on anticipated publishing um, across the years. And so we've been able to demonstrate a notional saving that the university is making if we had to pay for open access in, in many of these. And so we've been able to start making a case uh, for a central fund at the university. Uh, we've never had a central fund before, so this is an important piece of work, which the TA um, critical review has helped us to kick off. Um, so my other point about this is when we have a central fund, because so far the way that we've been investing 
in TAs has been by spending um, the open access block grants and trying to spend those responsibly. But as we move forwards and we're using more institutional funds, we probably need to think, readdress what our red lines are and what our objectives are because we need to be meeting um, our own objectives, not just those of the funders, if we're investing our own money. Um, so my, my final point is, um, as there is this market correction um, within the TAs and we're having the shift towards the publishing component and the increasing costs being allocated to the institutions, we might also want to think about how the open access block grants can be repurposed because, of course, they can also be used for us to create platforms and infrastructure and resources uh, to enable uh, authors to meet the open access policies. And again, that was restated in the letter that we received from UKRI on Wednesday. So it all seems very timely. Um, the letter from UKRI was very welcome in view of the critical review. So I would very much like to go forward and think what we should be doing in the future. I'll hand over to Jeremy. Thanks, Stephen, and thanks, colleagues, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so as part of this process, we are we were asked to, to do a bit of reflection, both from an individual and institutional point of view. So I'll pick up on a, on a couple of points uh, which have certainly been very for, at the forefront of my mind recently uh, around about this conversation. I think the first thing I would say is that, just to reiterate, the report is a great report. And one of the things I have reflected on this is I have been publicizing it widely because it really does, it has made me think differently about this, even though I've been involved closely in some of the discussions in the tail group, but I have been promoting it widely to say that this is a really good source of data for to start your thinking, to make you think afresh, perhaps, about where we're going in this kind of area. So that's my first kind of reaction, a really great positive response. But then in terms of specific things, and I think the first thing I want to highlight is something which has already been mentioned a couple of times at the conference and by colleagues, and that is around about equity. Uh, I was noticing it came up in the conversation um, around about AI, accessibility, and other topics. And certainly, I think seeing some of the numbers which uh, Kira highlighted in her presentation around about how far the reach has gone, or actually the opposite, how limited the reach has been in some of the UK space, and really, are we supporting something which is bringing about some change, not just in the UK, but more widely? And the data kind of has made me question that more. And I think that has also then brought me back to thinking about, again, what Stephen was saying, what are we trying to achieve here and what is our goal? And one of my reflections is, as a university, surely we should be committed to equity in the wider sense. And are these deals delivering a degree of equity? And I think I am questioning that. And certainly when we come back to think again about what we want to do in the future, that is definitely something I would want us to think about more clearly. What are we trying to do in that kind of space? I think my next reflection really is, and I have to admit this, that I think certainly locally we have failed perhaps, well, no, we haven't perhaps, we have failed to engage as effectively with some of our key stakeholders. Because in some ways, the um, the deals have made some things quite easy. And I think thinking here particularly of our academic community, uh, as the as the um, report highlights, the, some of the processes have been very straightforward. But in a way, one of the effects of that is that we haven't seen much change in behavior and we haven't had the need to talk and engage and explain about what's going on in the background and some of the things we want that community to engage with. And I think that is important because they are the ones who are going to eventually drive change in this space. We're not going to achieve that as a library community. We have to work alongside our stakeholders. So I think, like I say, one of my other take takeaways is to renew that, to think again, how do we do that better? And I think my, my thinking at the moment is very much about trying to reposition open access in the wider open science, open scholarship space, not to talk just about open access, but to recognize this is part of a much bigger and cultural change. Colleagues have already highlighted my next one, which is really about taking a harder line on what good, good looks like. There are some things here which are good. There are some things which have come through in this report, really, which is not good. And just that number, which highlights the rate of change, just keeps coming back. Even though I've now seen it many times, it still kind of horrifies you when you see that. And I think reflecting on some of our work in the tail group, 
just to be clear, yes, we have had some really good conversations with some good publishers who are really interested in exploring where we go with this. But on the other side of it, we have had some not so good conversations, I think, to put it politely. And therefore, that just that um, experience backed up by the report does make me think we need to take a harder line on and work harder to understand as to what we think good looks like and what we really do want to commit. And picking up on Stephen's comments about where we put our money, to be quite honest. I think leading on from that, it does make me think that there is a need to think harder about the alternatives. Uh, and I think, again, looking at the report, I, I now reflect back and think I was probably thinking quite simplistically at the start of all this, that TAs may bring a kind of magic transformation which we can all buy into and it's going to solve lots of problems. And maybe the reality is, I should, well, I should have been more realistic about it at the start, possibly. But the reality is that we are probably have a, it's highlighted, we, the report has highlighted, we have a more complex environment. Different subject disciplines will may need different solutions. It's not going to be simple. And therefore, I absolutely, and I, I hear Stephen saying this uh, and others, that there is that need for more investment in alternatives to understand what other options might work across the board. And I think my final point of reflection is, <clears throat> we do have to live in the real world and maybe we need to think about how we separate out what we need to do now and then how we can do that, but still give us the energy and focus to think about where we want to go. I get a sense sometimes we get a bit caught up mixing those two up. The reality is our academic communities in the next couple of years will still want access to content and we as professionals still need to work to find the best way to do that. But we should also find a way to separate that off a little bit so that we can have the energy and time to focus in really on what the bigger picture is going to look like. So that's my reflections. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeremy, and thanks all. Um, it's interesting hearing you speak and getting this kind of sense of slow disillusionment. So my my first question to the group, and, and we'll start with you, Jeremy, is do you still believe that TAs will deliver an open access and open science world? Yeah, thank you. It's it's quite funny because we had, we had a meeting yesterday in my university, uh, and actually for the first time I had an academic on the committee who asked me this exact question. We'd we'd had to put through a paper about the Wiley deal to get authorization to spend the money, and actually someone came back and I, I did have a moment to smile at this point. But I said it's exactly the right question to ask, so we need to do that. I think as you heard from my presentation. Um, I'm not as, uh, you know, I, I, I don't have the same level of belief that I had, when, I think, a couple of years ago when we went into that. And I am now much, uh, much less uh, certain about it. Uh, as I said, I think there have been some good things that have come out from this. And I guess I also, I started from a position where I do see publishing still as primarily a transactional activity. There is value, whatever we think of the, the organizations in terms of what they do, and this was really about finding a way to get better value, appropriate price for what we're being delivered. But I think one of the things that has made me, uh, sorry, on the positive side, there are people who want to have those kind of conversations with us. So if you're asking, um, is do they still have an opportunity to deliver with the right partners? I think there could be a chance to do that. On the other side though, I am now more convinced there are some partners who are just really not interested have, we've given every opportunity to show a level of commitment to work with this kind of model, are uh, not showing it. And I think the other thing that it's made me think is actually fundamentally, do we need to work with other types of partners? And even think possibly are commercial publishers ever going to be the right kind of partners if this is the kind of model we want to develop? Thank you. Sarah, Stephen, did you wanna? Sarah? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the question was, do we still believe TAs will deliver and open access our open science worlds. And I, I think I'm firmly in the no camp, at least not for the biggest commercial publishers for the reasons Jeremy has just been um, articulating so clearly. Um, the report for me highlighted some publishers for whom TAs have been successful, actually, some smaller society publishers. And I would guess those are ones who are not overly dependent on their journal revenue um, to keep the society afloat. But um, I think the range and scale of journals within a big publisher's portfolio is just enormously varied. Um, and it's a model based on, tends to be based on per article charges that just not, isn't a good fit for many journals in many disciplines. Um, and one size definitely doesn't fit all. 
So I think we really need a more sustainable and affordable publishing system that needs to include a variety of business models and a mix of output types, rather than it all being just about the journal article. Um, and even more fundamentally, as others have said, we need a more equitable publishing system that doesn't exclude so many people from participating in it. And I think um, that last point is something for me that came out very, very strongly in um, the DISC report as well, just even in the UK, you know, where you think we have the resource to put into this, um, just so many people can't participate and benefit from TAs. All right, and um, so the, the question was, uh, do we still believe TAs deliver, uh, will deliver an OA or open science world? Um, just, uh, <laughs> I, I'm on the opposite scale to Jeremy, I suppose, in a way, because I seem to remember uh, when I first introduced myself at the first TAOG meeting, I said, I don't like TAs. Uh, I don't think that they're going to work. And that's why I'm here. Um, I, I, I saw them as a dilution of Plan S. Um, the idea that a uh, journal could flip um, when it reaches 50% open access for argument's sake, um, because subscription journals have page budgets, the editors are expected to meet 100% of those page budgets. 50% OA means that you've got to, in the simplest terms, uh, create 200% of the copy you had before. Uh, and don't think that a, a publisher wouldn't set the page budget as high as they thought they could reasonably do so, because that's directly uh, equal to the, the amount that they can charge for that subscription. So in, in simple terms, I didn't think that they would work. Um, and I was concerned about the undermining of the green open access. Southampton has always been a green open access institution. We developed the print software. So that's always been the party line at Southampton. Um, and so I felt that this would undermine the progress that we'd made in those respects. However, as I said in my presentation, we have had pockets of success. Um, we've had um, negotiation power by having these uh, big agreements with lots of money floating around and strong representation from JISC and UUK, we've been able to actually approach these uh, publishers and uh, make demands of them that we probably wouldn't have been able to in a different circumstance. So I don't think that TAs have worked in the way that they're meant to. I don't think that they have yet transformed anything, but I think that we can be more bullish and I think we can ask more of them and we have the power to do so now. I also think that they've helped us understand models of negotiating with publishers, which will enable us to be stronger negotiating partners in future. And with respect to open science or open research, um, I also think that we should start pressing them to say what we want them to do in order to remove barriers to open research. Uh, there, you know, there, there, there is an education program that publishers need to go through to educate their editors not to reject uh, submissions on the basis of similarity with preprints and theses. We need them to build uh, better references to research data into their systems and better structured data for us to interrogate it and have linked data. So we, these are all things that we can be pressing for in future negotiations, I feel. So I think from an optimist's point of view, yes, they can in the future uh, deliver a better world than we had in the first place, but at present we're not quite there yet. Thanks, Stephen. I think that leads nicely into the next question, which is what changes are you considering for the immediate future? Um, and I'll go to, to Sarah first on this one. Yeah, thanks, Kira. So I've already spoken a little bit about this, but um, due to financial pressures um, and um, we're therefore highly likely to withdraw from some TAs um, from next year onwards. And we're also seeking to protect our financial support for non-article based models as far as practically possible. Um, we realize that we need to do all this openly and transparently um, at York within our institution. Um, and to do that, we need a vision that people can buy into so we're going to create co-create some co-principles with our academics 
that will help to guide our purchasing renewal and cancellation decisions. And these will include spelling out what we continued, what we consider to be unacceptable publisher behaviours. Um, but more positively, they'll also reaffirm our commitment to open scholarly publishing um, and to seeking new ways to reach that goal. So we, and importantly, we also, alongside that, that advocacy piece with our academics, we need to make sure we've got the support of senior leaders within our, within our institution so that they understand the direction that we're going in. This is a very complicated landscape, as we know. We need to bring them with us and we need um, them to help advocate for this too and to buy into this, this kind of vision of the future. Um, none of them are going to be willing to do this um, alone. So, you know, it, it's in incredibly important that we also join together these conversations happening across institutions also. Thanks, Sarah. Stop there. Thanks. <laughs> Jeremy or Stephen, anything to add? Um, yeah, just um, that we we've, we've recently had some negotiations where we felt like we're a bit in between a rock and a hard place. We could have very easily walked away from some agreements that were recently reached um, in order to try and secure best terms in the future. Uh, but a lot of other institutions had already indicated that they would accept or maybe better word is tolerate uh, an agreement. Um, and so the, the that was the rock uh, and the hard place was the idea of working out how we continue to support our uh, our authors and our readers and create, you know, create a um, system where they're not going to be disadvantaged and Unfortunately, the alternative is more costly or at least equally costly, but then our authors are at, at a disadvantage. So we've been forced to uh, take those agreements, really, like, even though they don't align with our sort of uh, principles and uh, desired outcomes of the of the negotiations. So at Southampton, um, we are going to be readdressing uh, what our red lines are and developing some documentation that says about when are we going to uh, consult with our wider academic um, community under what circumstances would we reject an agreement under what circumstances would we feel comfortable to uh, accept an agreement even if it doesn't meet all of our terms so that will hopefully help us uh, to have those sort of thought through solid guidelines uh, to help us with those sorts of situations in the future. Yeah, just a couple of quick comments to add to that. I'd agree with what colleagues say, uh, have said. I think to, to build on that thing in terms of being more assertive, and I think just to bring it back to the conversation today, the report I think allows us to do that because it gives us something to point to to say certain things have not happened. Uh, they're not working for us if you don't make a change and this has been shown by the report, then we're now going to not accept that. And thankfully, quite honestly, we're not going to work alongside you. So I think it is about that being being more assertive. And then I'd agree the other piece about conversations and thinking about, I mean, it is a challenge to get the academic community to engage with and thinking carefully, I think about who in the community we can work with, who can help us bring about change. And to me, that brings us back to, I think we've had more success on the open science, open scholarship type conversations. And maybe there's something in there where we can build on a bit of success with those kind of conversations to try and help widen out some of the uh, particular conversations about open access. I think so. Um, I think we've started to tease out how immediate changes will kind of inevitably develop into longer term strategies. But to build on that, um, how do we develop those longer term strategies? Um, Nikki's posted a, a question in the chat. Easy question. What could global open access future look like? <laughs> um, so how do we how do we start to figure out what the future looks like? So, uh, Jeremy, I'll, I'll hand that over to you first. Uh, thanks for that one. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the honest position is if it was easy, we'd have got there already. Uh, so I think actually there is something in that itself and just being more realistic and honest. 
that, as I said at the start, I, I had quite high hopes uh, as we moved into more transitional deals that maybe that would move things forward quickly, but it didn't. And maybe I should have accepted that this is difficult and uh, it is going to take time. So I think in terms of getting <clears throat> to a longer term strategy, uh, the fundamental is going to mean a lot of hard work. Um, so we need to think about who has where the resources for that to take place. Uh, as with all kind of developing a strategy, we have to think carefully about what, what is the vision. And again, I suppose you could possibly reflect uh, on the on the outcome of the report that maybe part of the reason we're seeing some of the things is that had we lost sight of what our vision was, what were the fundamentals that we were trying to achieve? So I think there needs to be a fresh conversation about vision. Um, clearly, we've also touched a lot already on the whole business of working with stakeholders. And you've heard my view that I think we could have done more. We definitely need to go back and do more. This world isn't going to, we aren't going to be able to change this world. The report has highlighted that to me and we need to go back and work harder uh, with our stakeholders. Um, and as I say, I think just being more realistic that we are in a, a very complex um, environment. There aren't simple solutions, but try not to panic about that and like that to stop us experimenting, looking at, making perhaps having to accept that we're only going to make smaller steps forward so i know it's not a great um kind of answer to give an immediate answer as to how to do that but i think there is a degree of reality um certainly what's come out of the report to me and has reminded me that this is fundamentally a very complex space thanks jeremy anything brief um Stephen or sarah to add to that uh, yeah, I mean, as I previously said, I think we need to develop red lines, but I think we need to do that nationally as well. I think that we could be a bit harder on publishers during negotiations and contracts um, discussions if we were to commission a new university building and targets were missed. Uh, the, the building firm wouldn't expect to uh, get pulled, paid the full amount or, or their bonuses. So from that point of view, I think that we need to be setting some key performance indicators and either, um, you know, putting um, punishments effectively in, in, in place or, uh, or bonuses if you want to be more positive about it, if, if uh, those are met. Uh, but we have to be very careful about what those KPIs are as well, because, of course, you don't want your lumberjack to produce millions of matchsticks you want some good quality logs um so uh from that point of view uh for example i think that we need to be ensuring that eligible articles are converted so it's not a case of say asking for them to produce more open access because then you get them commissioning more papers and they might be of a lower quality so it, it should be about uh converting eligible articles um, in terms of Nikki's sort of elaboration on that question about what, what does global picture have to look like, I think it's mixed models. And I think that the communities that the platform serve will determine what those look like eventually. Um, and I think that we need to sort of assist the publishers with identifying what those mixed models look like. Great, thank you. Sarah, did you want to add anything? Or I'll just be really quick, Kira. So I would just say that I think um, we need to work together collectively on this. Um, and that's the way that we, we can influence both strongly internally and, and influence that internal research culture piece as well. So just to give one quick example of that, at York, we, we were able to introduce rights retention into our, our research publications policy relatively easily. Now, that's because we weren't the very first in the UK to do that. That was thanks to Jeremy and his colleagues at Edinburgh but also because we did it alongside other institutions within um, the region, within the N8 Research Partnership, that's um, the universities in the North, research intensive universities in the North of the UK. And that en enormously reassured our senior leaders um, and we got their buy in that way. So being able to say that we're working collectively and that we have this vision um, and that we know where we're going to, I think will give us that stronger voice and recognition um, to help us move this forward. Yeah, definitely a key theme from beginning to end that seems to be coming out is how the conversation needs to get bigger and include more people. Um, 
so on that note, the the last question I'll post to the panel before we get to the the really good ones in the chat is how do we better engage with our academics as well as the wider research community and other stakeholders to reinvigorate these discussions? And uh, I'll pass it to you first, Stephen. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I think it's obviously contextual. Um, the the purpose of engagement um, needs to match. Um, the, the actual engagement activity. So actually understanding um, who our stakeholders are, how we should engage with them in different circumstances is important. Um, certainly I want to take a more project-based approach to acquisition in future, um, actually do a proper stakeholder analysis. Um, and if anyone can remember when you do that and you have your quadrants of keep informed, uh, you know, keep satisfied, um, manage closely, etc. So um, from, from that point of view, I'd, I'd like to take that approach in the future. Um, but I mean, ultimately, with all of these agreements, we're aiming to reduce friction uh, with, uh, with publishing open access. And so we need to identify where that friction is by engaging with state relevant stakeholders. Uh, but by doing that, we're also decreasing the visibility of open access um, as you make things easier for people to do them, then it's going to become less visible to them, which is the double edged sword that we're dealing with, where there's a decline in engagement with green open access because of how easy we're making it to engage with hybrid open access. Um, and also, um, there, there are these sorts of contradictions with some people uh, feeling that these kinds of agreements are being done to them. But then if you actually go out and you consult sometimes, they'll turn around to you and say, well, you're the librarian, you're the expert, um, you tell me what we should be doing. So there, there are those kinds of contradictory conversations that are going on. So ultimately, I think that we need to uh, come up with clear guidelines on when we should be consulting with our uh, stakeholders, um, that we should be uh, uh, prepared to work with individuals when they want to work with us. Uh, but also we should just um, develop a uh, sense that librarians are professionals and are experts in this area. And so we can be the experts, we can make those decisions uh, in consultation with the academics so that they can be left to be the experts and the professionals in their respective areas and don't have to worry about licensing and all these kinds of things. Thanks, Stephen. Jeremy or Sarah, anything you want to add? Yeah. Just quick. Oh, sorry, Sarah. No, you go next, Jeremy. Very quick. Um, Again, I mean, I've highlighted the point about, for me, it's about thinking about talking about open access in other spaces. And just quickly, I'm aware that a number of institutions in the UK, and partly as a result of REF, are doing a lot of work around about research cultures. And there's a very active, there's a very active conversation going on in our institution. It's thinking about where are there other opportunities to pick up in Stephen's points that we have a professional and a knowledge which we can bring into these wider conversations. But where are these spaces where we can bring some of this conversation about this change, the change, the publication process, etc.? Where can we bring that into that so that we can then start having a wider conversation with the people who are trying to change other aspects of research, which we all know needs to happen before true open access is going to be delivered? Yeah, I completely agree with with the ref being a, a big opportunity for for us to engage with this these conversations in a new way and get get more people's attention as well because ref always brings with it that focus and that attention that maybe some other things don't um and i would just add one thing which is about um recognizing our academics role and identity within their own subject disciplines because sometimes and quite often that can transcend their um sense of belonging to um a particular university so i think also if we can tap into our academics involvement with societies who are publishers and with societies who contract out publishing, um, if we can demonstrate our willingness to support and engage with those societies that have the greatest impact on their academic work, I think that's another way that we can we can um, engage our academics in this. Wonderful, thanks all. Uh, we'll open it up to the floor. I think we've we've already got lots of questions in the chat, which is great. 
Um, we'll start with the first one, which is for Stephen. Uh, Paul asks, as publishers seem to be offering fewer read-only options, do you have a plan to retain access to the content? No, I don't. And I don't think it's my responsibility either because we need to work collectively with this. We need to work out uh, as a sector how we can uh, retain access to the content. Um, the, as I said, Southampton has been one of the last people, uh, the last institutions holding out uh, against certain agreements recently. Um, and we've been trying to stand our ground but other institutions have decided that the agreements are acceptable and and gone ahead and in those circumstances it has always been that rock and hard place situation where it's just too costly for us to do the other option or um the situation has been that um even if it's the same cost the advance there are advantages to the ta over the the alternative um I think that if we want to progress beyond a point where, um, where where the publishers can just make an agreement just so, just about okay, tolerable, um, we need to be a lot firmer and more bullish and we need to collectively come up with plans uh, to retain the content and to manage the publishing if we do decide to walk away from a negotiation. Can I just come in quickly? So just, Stephen, I think hearing you talk and thinking about some of the conversations uh, more recently, you probably now are in the right place. Because again, picking up on Sarah's point at the recent um, Sconal content event, and when there was a show of hands in terms of the financial situation in the UK and who was expecting to see reductions, almost everybody put their hand up. And I think... It's great to make use of a crisis, to be quite honest. There's so I think many institutions are going to be in this same place. This is a really great opportunity for us to develop a harder line on this. So I think we could be coming back to you, Stephen, to you know get your get your thinking about how best we do that. Thanks both. Uh, we also have a question from Siobhan. Uh, what does the panel feel would be the main challenges around moving to Diamond, not just in the classic sense, but also in the context of open data, OERS, community-owned infrastructure? Anyone want to take that one? I I, I will. I mean, I, I don't think there's necessarily a need to move to Diamond. Like, there will be in certain communities. As I say, it's about the biblia diversity um, and the diversity of business models. Where Diamond makes sense, we should do Diamond and we should support that. Um, but I don't think there should necessarily be like a wholesale effort to move to Diamond because these kinds of initiatives, they, they require a lot of investment and engagement. They often require a lot of community invest investment in time and resource as well, not just financial investment. A lot of people working for free uh, to to make a success of these platforms. So they need to be useful and usable, um, and there have to be the use cases. So I think diamond initiatives will come. I think that as institutions, we should uh, value things like the POSI principles. Um, I think that the Barcelona Declaration, which is going to be published on the 16th of April, I believe, um, which is about um, us investing in uh, abstracting and indexing um, and, and analytic systems, which uh, in, embody the POSI principles, uh, is an important thing. Um, so I think that it will come over time as initiatives pop up and we see the value in them. But I don't think that there necessarily has to be a tremendous effort towards Diamond. So I'd, I'd agree with Stephen's position being an organisation which is investing some um, some resource into Diamond. It is about what we talked about earlier. It's going to be a mixed economy. And I absolutely have seen um, areas where Diamond works really well, and that's fine. But as Stephen says, I don't think it's going to work for every area, but it doesn't. So it's just being aware of you know where things are effective and appropriate, and that's fine and supporting them, but not to forget there are, of course, other models which we'll have to look at for other types of solution. 
Yeah, and just coming on that, I say um, Diamond, um, I think is really, is a good counterpoint actually to uh, the commercial publishers and the TA models. So we we, we definitely need more, more Diamond, more different types of uh, organizations, more community-based models. This all takes time to build up, it adds complexity, but I think without that variety, um, we, we just don't have a a sustainable and affordable future of scholarly publishing, I'm afraid. So it, it looks going to take more effort and more insight and more more energy, more more lots of things. But um, we do need to support, try and support and keep all these balls um, kind of in the air. Um, while and unless we do invest, I think I differ slightly from Stephen. I think unless we do put more effort and investment into things like Diamond. Um, and take it away from the big publishers, we're not going to see any significant change. So I'm actually more in favour of being a bit a bit more radical. Uh, I know it's not easy, and it's very simplistic, I know. But yeah, that's where my thinking is at the moment. Thanks, so. I think, I can't remember the last time we were all in exact agreement. That's kind <laughs> of the, the fun with this uh, this kind of project. I think we have time for one last question from Nikki, uh, which is, should we move from thinking of publishers as stakeholders? I was talking to a publisher on Wednesday and I said that publishers, that quite often publishers and libraries see libraries as the customers of publishers, but publishers are also the customers of institutions because there is a transaction where we are providing commodity in the form of the research output for them to then sell. So publishers are our customers as much as we are their customers. If we cut the copy off to them, they wouldn't have a business model, it'd be dead. Um, so if you wanna be radical, that's the way to do it. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I, I, I think that, yeah, I mean, well, they are stakeholders and we're stakeholders um and everyone around the the infrastructure uh, are stakeholders um but we have to be realistic about what the power dynamics actually are and and um actually feel a bit more empowered to 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 push the publishers around a little bit more so yeah i agree with stephen i think it is um they have an important part to play, but it's about changing the nature of the relationship. And as you highlighted, Stephen, it's about where the power sits. And I think my my answer to the question then would be, you know, they should be stakeholders, but only in the way that we want them to be. And if they don't want to follow those rules, then we don't want them to be stakeholders and we'll work with other people. And um, just to add to that, I think we need to really listen to what our academics value from publishers and, and um, which publishers they particularly value as societies and who they want to who they want to work with who they feel are adding um uh real uh i guess really contributing to that scholarly endeavor and and um the future of this of the discipline um and those are the the publishers that we really want to engage more with um we're not interested in engaging ever more with just the very big players who are um interested in growing their revenues above um, anything else so yeah